Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Diving into the Abyss, Navigating Supply Chain Security with NIST CSF 2.0. My name is Melissa Russell, and I'll be the host for today's webinar. And before we get started, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, we are recording today's session, and we will be making the recording available as well as a PDF of the slides, and you'll be getting a follow-up email with those tomorrow. We will allow a little bit of time at the end for Q&A, so please feel free to put those questions into the Q&A box and Paul will take care of them at the end. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to our speaker, Paul Azadorian. He is our Principal Security Evangelist here at Eclipsium, and he is ready to get started. Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Melissa. Thanks everyone uh, for joining today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, a lot about actually the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework and it's fairly recent update uh, to 2.0. We'll look at how it impacts uh, supply chain security and spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about not just CSF, but some other regulations and how they relate to supply chain security. Um, I'll go over a little bit about uh, compliance standards in general, kind of my thoughts and feelings on those uh, as well. Um, actually last night on a uh, podcast that I host called Paul Security Weekly, uh, we had a pretty in-depth discussion about uh, compliance frameworks, uh, which we hadn't done on the show in quite some time. Uh, so that was a, a good primer, and uh, I can refer you to uh, that uh, towards the end uh, that we recorded that last night on my podcast. So it was a good kind of primer uh, for uh, this discussion. And then I'll give you an overview of Eclipsium Solutions and uh, I'll try not to make it too much like a product pitch, but I've got some screenshots from our product. Um, and I just want to talk about what uh, what those give you, some of the insights that um, it would give you onto your systems in terms of supply chain uh, risk management, uh, if you will, and um, talk about like the functionality and why it, it's important to uh, match up to a lot of the things that these compliance and standards uh, are recommending uh, that you do. In some cases, uh, it's going to become a point where you must uh, do some of these things. Um, so I want to talk about some of the ins and outs of where the rubber meets the road and how you can uh, validate the supply chain uh, of your devices and firmware and software. Um, so I think this timeline was super interesting to me. Um, I, I kind of dig the history behind um, a lot of these things in cybersecurity and the history behind um, the NIST CSF is uh, is pretty interesting as it ties back to uh, specific events that have happened, such as NotPetya, uh, that led to other such events that have created standards and encouraged the and defined the usage of those standards uh, across many different uh, industries, U.S. federal government, of course, uh, being one of them, and certainly extending out into U.S. federal government contractors. We'll talk about a little bit about that. I'll kind of recap some of the things that we uh, I discussed last night with some of my friends uh, and really dug into the details. So CISA um, forms a supply chain risk management task force um, in 2018 uh, that led to the NIST CSF. Um, there was a 2019 presidential executive order that also talked about supply chain security. Um, of course, everyone's favorite, uh, 853. Um, revision five added certain controls for uh, supply chain related activities in 2020. Then, of course, we got the very large uh, incident and breach of solar winds that shine this spotlight on supply chain security, specifically for uh, for software, right? Uh, as a result of the solar winds breach, and there's been you know many breaches after that. Um, that many of you probably heard folks talk about, seen in the news with the Move It breach uh, and several others that uh, relate to supply chain security. Of course, in the uh, UEFI space, um, there has been some writings about, I think there was an NSA guide uh, to UEFI security and some other publications. And I think a lot of what's driving that are uh, some of the research that we've done in Eclipsium to highlight vulnerabilities in UEFI and research from other um, firms as well uh, that have led to things like Pixie fail and Logo fail uh, that have come out recently uh, in in the news that you've seen, and they're very much you know supply chain related breaches as we talk about the uh, very complex supply chains that lead to our 
PC servers and laptops uh, that get delivered to our organizations uh, and all of the components in their, in their supply chains, a lot of that relates back to UEFI. So a lot of those recent events um, with vulnerabilities and specific breaches have led to further presidential orders. They've led to um, the revisions and uh, memos that are uh, driving us towards paying more attention to supply chain security, but not just paying attention to them. Some of the executive orders are like, we need to focus on this more and they're kind of broad, which I, I mean, which is fine. I think we we need some of that uh, general direction uh, for supply chain security. Um, but some of the actual standards and frameworks now are getting down the nitty gritty. Like what do you need to do in order to um, analyze the, the risk and posture of your supply chain? So uh, certainly a lot of activities uh, happening very recently uh, with uh, cybersecurity regulations. So let's look a little bit at the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, version one was actually published in 2013, again, in response to an executive order aiming to improve the cybersecurity of specifically critical infrastructure uh, and define, of course, you know, all of the identify protect that we'll talk about uh, a little bit as well which I think provides a nice framework for people to start thinking about how they would formulate their cybersecurity uh, policies uh, and procedures in the organization. Uh, and it's used as a reference guide for uh, a lot of activities and is very well adopted. Um, so 2 million uh, users across 185 uh, countries have uh, downloaded uh, the NIST CSF. So certainly a, a very popular framework because I think it provides a nice foundation uh, for folks to start developing their cybersecurity strategies. Um, uh, there were revisions in uh, 2014, uh, which added the first uh, sign of kind of guidance on supply chain risk management. There was revision in also in 2020. Um, it remained largely the same. However, uh, some of those were to clarify some of the wording in the framework. So that was kind of like a minor update in 2020. 2022, of course, uh, introduced version 2.0, which introduces the govern function that was added to provide specifically guidance on integrating supply chain risk management uh, throughout your entire cybersecurity program. So let's look at some of the new things that are in the 2.0. You know, again, there was, uh, we had recover, identify, protect, detect, and respond uh, as the main sections in the NIST CSF. Um, in this new 2.0 update, we've added this govern function, right, that encompasses all of the other areas uh, as well and <clears throat> provides guidance on uh, largely uh, the supply chain risk management and in general risk management. Um, and uh, as it states there, prioritize the outcomes of the other five uh, functions. So it's a pretty major update to uh, kind of get us uh, focused on the govern thing and how it interacts with all of these other areas. Um, so the there was a new category, right? So we've got the govern uh, overall function, and then the CSF is broken down into, uh, you know, like different uh, basically categories in a hierarchical structure. Um, so we add the govern function, and then we add a new category under the govern function called cybersecurity supply chain risk management. Um, which the goal is to identify, establish, manage, monitor, and improve um, the organizational stakeholders um, in the area of supply chain risk management. And underneath the um, uh, governance and supply chain risk management category, there's 10 subcategories underneath there, again, filling out that kind of hierarchical structure. <laughs> Excuse me. So I really like this quote from uh, from this article, you know, for security teams, governance necessitates establishing policies and procedures to make sure that cybersecurity efforts align with business objectives. Now, we haven't, you know, we've heard this before. I think if you've uh, studied cybersecurity and been in cybersecurity for uh, any amount of time, you've likely heard this notion. Uh, you've probably heard older folks like me talk about how we have to align our cybersecurity strategy with business objectives. And that's easy to say and you know, easy to understand, but what does it really mean, right? Um, as we dig into all of these uh, requirements. And you know, I think there's uh, a lot that goes into that alignment between them. I think that's why we have some of these standards um, that uh, define specific controls uh, 
to help us uh, understand what those controls are. But then it's up to you to look at all of those controls and then align it with the business objective. What is your risk posture? What, when you threat model, um, are some of the threats that you believe could come at your organization? Um, you know, what are we trying to protect? And where should we put our resources and efforts to protect our uh, various aspects of the business? Uh, and that's some of, you know, what it means, right? Uh, there's also a maturity kind of scale that you're on in protecting your organization uh, that you have to understand uh, how mature is your security program and also how is it aligned to uh, support your business objectives and specifically what what do you want to protect and how much effort do you want to put into protecting it and, and is it worth it, right? Does all that make sense um, to allow the business to continue to operate um, and take into account all of these various controls that could help with that and prioritizing them um, really means aligning that to uh, to your business. So it's very important not only to understand what some of these controls are, but understand your business, uh, the business that you work for. Um, wh what are those priorities in terms of the services or products uh, that you provide or create and um, how you can protect all of the infrastructure uh, to make sure that business survives. So, so the specific objectives, um, there's a lot of them. I kind of, you know, I highlighted some some areas and some uh, some phrases in here to kind of help uh, everyone kind of understand some of the uh, takeaways from a lot of these ob objectives that live in the supply chain uh, risk management uh, section uh, underneath governance. And um, so a cybersecurity supply chain risk management program, right? That's the first thing um, that their uh, guidance is being provided to say that you need a strategy, objective policies and procedures that are agreed upon by the stakeholders, right? Which is an important part of security is to get uh, buy-in from your organization and implement a supply chain risk management program. Now, what does that mean? We have to go through the other controls and objectives, right? To understand what um, is helping us make up that supply chain risk management uh, program. And uh, again, you know, tying it to the business, thinking about how your business operates, um, one of the first uh, objectives is defining those roles and responsibilities for your suppliers, customers, and partners, right? Um, so first things first, defining what some of your supply chains are and what the roles and responsibilities are. Um, I like to use UEFI as an example. In fact, you can look at some recent uh, blog posts that we have um, on the uh, Eclipsium website where uh, we visualize some of these um, and you can almost use that as a model, right? Um, when you look at how UEFI and OEMs and chip makers interact to create a system that's ultimately delivered to you, it's a very complex supply chain with lots of different roles and responsibilities. Right. And I think defining those and even understanding those um, as you look at supply chain risk management is important because um, not just so we know who to blame, but so that everyone knows what their role and responsibility is when there is a, vulner a supply chain vulnerability. Right. When there is um, a process that's making a, a component, what is their responsibility to protect that component, to respond to researchers who may find vulnerabilities or uh, other issues or threats inside of that component? Um, are you waiting on an upstream patch that, uh, for example, you know, UEFI, the, the EDK2 standard <clears throat> reference implementation has a vulnerability. That means the uh, responsibility of the UEFI firmware software creators like AMI, Phoenix, and Inside is to take that patch and apply it to their various versions of software. Then their responsibility is to send that off to their OEMs, uh, to the Dell, HP, Lenovo's of the world. Then they have to, into their responsibility then, and the role they play is they integrate um, that into their custom uh, firmware that shipped on their devices. And then that ships out to the customer. And then the responsibility of the customer is to apply that firmware update. So. Um, that's an example of how we have to understand the roles and responsibilities uh, in a supply chain uh, to be able to manage risk and to be able to mitigate uh, that risk and understand what goes into it uh, and set the appropriate timetables. In the example I just provided, obviously, uh, it's kind of a long tail, right? That's why some of these vulnerabilities in things like UEFI um, can take a while to fix 
because of all of the complexities in the supply chain and the roles and responsibilities of all the, the players. Um, so then we get into integrating cybersecurity and enterprise risk management. You know, this is something we talked about uh, last night. And um, I think a, a, a notion of uh, that's being put forth to the cybersecurity community is uh, not to have that separation of security and risk management is to blend those uh, together, to work hand in hand together to go, yes, I'm the boots to the ground security IT administrator, and I'd like to protect it in this certain way. Well, how can we use compliance um, as an example to help support that effort, right? Uh, I think is one effective way to use compliance uh, in your environment. And, you know, the other way is kind of like that inverse relationship, which is uh, what this control, I think, is really talking about that integration is to go, well, we're going to apply, you know, this level of security to this particular thing. And by the way, that's also going to make us uh, compliant, right? So we have to have this uh, nice uh, relationship between uh, security and compliance. I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, people will sometimes ask, you know, is does compliance mean security? And does security mean compliance? And I don't think there's a a binary answer to that, right? There's a, in my opinion, a very complex relationship between uh, security and compliance. Um, and it, it, there's a lot of different aspects to it, but they they definitely have a relationship that you you have to manage uh, within your organization. Uh, and also the the last one here is talking about you know being integrated into contracts, which. I think you're uh, you're gonna start seeing um, <clears throat> with things such as uh, CMMC, uh, those are going to be integrated into contracts, right? And this is this is an interesting security driver for me that integration into contracts. Um, you know, back when I was consulting and helping organizations, you know, understand their threat landscape and helping them develop a plan um, to put defenses in place. Oftentimes that was driven by compliance. And oftentimes I think security people are like, oh, compliance is not really security, but it's a great driver for it because, you know, businesses that I was I was helping as an example go, hey, we need a lot of this security stuff and we're kind of lost. And the reason we need it is because we're getting this contract uh, from this new customer and that new customer has integrated into the contract that we have to have these security controls and they're defining specific things that we have to attest to and show proof of um, before we can get the contract. So um, now the supply chain is integrated into a lot of these compliance standards and into uh, contracts. Uh, it's something that we have to pay attention to and be able to attest to as well. And there are several more uh, controls, uh, right? I won't uh, you know, read the slide verbatim. You can go read the controls as well. Um, and so there's a lot more controls in here that uh, we need to understand. Um, you know, specifically those risks posed by a supplier, uh, I, I think is interesting, right? To look at, understand who your suppliers are and understand, do a little threat modeling to understand what risk is posed by that supplier and do kind of a ranking, right? Maybe where we get our, our PCs, maybe where we get our software, again, allotting that to the business. How critical is this hardware, software, firmware? to the operation of the business? What would the impact be if there were to be some kind of supply chain issue or breach with that particular software? Uh, and then how would we implement controls to help mitigate that risk, which is really what a, a lot of these compliance standards uh, are trying to, um, trying to convey and trying to guide you on is developing exactly that strategy. Okay, so how does uh, NIST CSF ties into your compliance and other regulatory uh, compliance uh, standards as well? Everyone's uh, you know favorite 853 uh, certainly uh, comes into comes into play, right? And provides uh, even more uh, controls and details that support the NIST CSF, so they have a relationship uh, <clears throat> between them. And 853, of course, has the 40 controls across 12 families, um, and supply chain security plays a critical role inside uh, of this compliance standard uh, as well. Um, so if you're uh, looking at this compliance standard, you understand that also supply chain security comes into play in 853. 
There's also um, other things that happened, such as May 2021 uh, executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity um, has, you know, specifically called out uh, the security integrity of critical software, right? And largely, I think it's up to us to define what critical software means. And I think the criticality, um, you got to break down into a few different categories, right? There's, um, well, yeah, this is critical software to the functioning of a system, right? UEFI, again, as an example, is critical software. The system's not going to boot up um, and it provides a really low level of access, uh, a high privilege level to an attacker. So in that sense, sure, it's critical to the system, um, but how critical are those systems to your business, right? So take that and, and apply that to your business. Um, and you may break it out into different uh, areas of your business uh, to define what critical software means uh, in relation to where it's used inside of your business, who, what roles uh, of the people in your organization are, are using that software, uh, how critical are their roles to the business, uh, as an example. So uh, a, a little more defining, you know, is needed here to kind of uh, go off of the uh, executive order that was issued in May of 2021. Uh, we also have DHS in uh, commerce assessment uh, of supply chains uh, that was published in February of 2022, um, specifically calling out firmware. You know, again, our roots here at Eclipsium are, are looking at, at firmware, uh, specifically UEFI. Uh, and that certainly, as I've uh, you know already conveyed, there's some you know big vulnerabilities that impact a number of different systems uh, in a few different ways. Um, and so this report... Um, talks about firmware, um, it's ever expanding attack surface, um, you know, recognizing that um, as attackers look to uh, escalate privileges and maintain access and persistence on systems, uh, that attackers are, are largely, there's evidence they're turning to uh, firmware. And um, it is also, as I point out here in bold, you know, a single point of failure in devices and one of the stealthiest methods which an attacker can compromise devices at scale. And certainly we've seen, you know, some of those examples. We have a firmware attack timeline uh, on our website that talks about the different strains of malware that are specifically targeting firmware uh, and, and some of the attack groups that those, uh, that those pieces of malware are tied to. So we've seen uh, evidence of that. We've seen um, a number of different recent, even recently uh, BMC, baseboard management controllers, right? This is uh, hardware and firmware that's embedded inside of your system, has access to all of the hardware, but provides software that allows you to manage that system. And a lot of that BMC software recently, uh, it, it, over time, and especially recently, I should say, um, has succumbed to uh, many different vulnerabilities that uh, should be patched. Um, you know, NVIDIA uh, most recently, and some of its really super expensive supercomputers um, they just release a whole round of uh, patches for vulnerabilities. And it's interesting, the, some of the advice that you'll see as well, just don't connect these to the network or, or, or don't expose them to the internet. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's one strategy, but keep in mind that the functionality of these uh, BMCs is so that you have access to it in case that system fails, as an example, and could rebuild it and could access that system uh, if the primary system was offline. So by nature... To utilize the functionality of a BMC, it has to be connected to the network. Uh, so, of course, my recommendation, which is easy for me to say and much harder to do, uh, is to make sure that you apply uh, the software updates and have a process that ties back to a control that says, yes, we will apply these firmware updates in areas such as BMCs and UEFI and maybe perhaps some other firmware that uh, is relevant to your business and the operation of your infrastructure and systems. <clears throat> the Office of Management and Budget, um, in uh, a time frame of September to June 2023, um, uh, um, provided guidance on critical softwares that agencies must collect attestations um, and uh, kind of laid out that uh, software also includes firmware, operating system, applications, and application services, which I think is an important uh, distinction. When I look at, uh, I should include the slide here, right? But when I look at, I think this is important because if I look at the landscape in which we 
uh, can uh, evaluate a, a supply chain. It's, you know, the supply chain of your hardware. It's the supply chain of your low level firmware. It goes on to your bootloader, it goes up to your operating system. It goes to third party commercial or open source applications. And it also extends into software that you write yourself that largely encompasses libraries that are written by somebody else, right? Um, so understanding the different supply chains that you have in your environment um, and then figuring out ways to attest to the integrity of those supply chains uh, is really what many of these compliance standards and, and memorandums are uh, referring to and in, in offering guidance. On. And we'll talk about how to accomplish some of those things as well. Uh, so the uh, National Cybersecurity Strategy Implementation Plan was released in July of 2023 um, and had, it contained specific language, uh, specifically in Section 5.5 on securing uh, global supply chains, um, promote the development of secure, trustworthy networks and services that are, are technology related, um, more diverse and resilient supply chains. I think this speaks to the, the hardware supply chain. Um, which is an interesting aspect of, of a supply chain threat that's not necessarily related to a vulnerability or necessarily a malicious actor. But that is, if I have critical systems in my environment, I think through the pandemic, many of us were evaluating the supply chain of our hardware. Well, how do I get, you know, a thousand more laptops? What's my supply chain for that? Um, how, how would I make sure that I have access to that supply chain? Am I choosing uh, a particular uh, component and or uh, product that has a resilient supply chain that I can get that product that <clears throat> whoever's providing me with that product can attest to the supply chain. We'll talk about a couple of different examples of, <laughs> excuse me, vendors that are doing uh, interesting things in uh, helping us evaluate and be able to attest to some of those aspects of the supply chain. <laughs> So uh, the NDAA, right, this is the basically bunch of money that gets approved every year so that the Department of Defense uh, can go buy stuff. Um, and in doing this, the U.S. Senate has included language uh, related to NDAA that um, they expressed concern malicious cyber actors are increasingly targeting the kernel and firmware in IT and OT infrastructure, um, which is largely an undefended attack vector. <laughs> I find it interesting that things that I've said and, and you know others here in Eclipsium and my peers uh, have said exactly this. But now this is coming from the U.S. Senate that if we're going to approve this spending and we're going to go <clears throat> acquire new technology or uh, update our technology, that the supply chain of this infrastructure is increasingly important, not just in IT, but of course in OT as well. Uh, in protecting um, ICS uh, systems uh, in uh, critical uh, industries. So um, they directed that they, we prevent, detect, and remediate firmware threats and attacks mounted through supply chain and remote operations. Um, so I thought this was important kind of, uh, you know, spelling it out for us um, that we need to pay attention to not just the operating system that we have to patch, not just our applications, but uh, firmware as uh, a piece uh, of that puzzle that we have to pay attention to. Okay. So now that we've kind of gone through some of the uh, ways in which we've seen regulations and uh, memorandums and other uh, compliance standards uh, make these recommendations to go, we all need to pay attention. Basically what they're saying, right? We all need to pay attention to um, the supply chain of our assets in our environment. Um, so how do we start doing that? So Eclipse Unit has, uh, we have provided this platform uh, for you to do that and monitor your uh, environment through an enterprise console that allows you to look at not just the asset itself, right? But all of the components within those assets that are hardware, that are firmware, that are uh, software on those devices and evaluate the supply chain through many different mechanisms. Those could be vulnerabilities, those could be integrity, or those could be threats. I think it's interesting to, to talk about how each uh, of those three kind of play out. Um, so this is just an example of a, 
of the dashboard and how we can look at the, the vendors and the products uh, and our total assets within our environment. Also kind of just uh, looking at some of the higher level things that you can uh, look at in, in the platform is that uh, for each individual asset um, that it's comprised of all of these different components, right? It has a UEFI and a BIOS. There is a processor and a chipset, which also has its own microcode on there. There's TPM modules, which also contain firmware uh, that researchers have pointed out that there's vulnerabilities in the software that runs on top of your TPM chip, right? Um, so we're checking for those issues. Your Intel management engine is uh, also a BMC-like functionality that's built into your Intel-based uh, PCs to PCI devices, network controllers, you know, all of these different components have uh, their own supply chain, but also uh, some of their own vulnerabilities and threats as well. Um, so we can detect some of uh, the threats that are specifically going after some of these uh, lower level components. Uh, of course, Black Lotus uh, was popularized um, in, in the not too distant past, right? Um, it came on as something that was being actually uh, transacted uh, amongst threat actors uh, is how it was discovered, right? And then we actually saw it being used in the wild, taking advantage of specific vulnerabilities in Windows bootloaders uh, and building on those vulnerabilities to then go ahead and bypass uh, the secure boot mechanism to put malicious software on systems. Um, <clears throat> so if you're specifically uh, looking for this threat, uh, you know, our technology can help you identify specific threats, such as Black Lotus, that would appear on uh, primarily your PCs. The other kind of exciting thing that uh, I think our, our platform helps you with is gain some visibility into some of those network devices um, and network appliances. And this has been widely popularized um, in, in the security news recently really relied upon by a lot of ransomware actors. We saw a lot of ransomware uh, groups using these vulnerabilities in our VPN concentrators, um, firewalls, and other such things in order to uh, accomplish their goals in their campaign. And so our platform is set up to uh, interact and, and provide you some visibility of varying levels based on the vendor and based on the, on the device. Um, and we're <clears throat> working very, very tirelessly to add more support to our uh, network device stack uh, and be able to provide even further visibility uh, and support more platforms um, because it's become such an uh, attack vector. And I feel like it's one of those kind of, um, you know, forgotten about things uh, on your network. Also, many of these devices are it, it have to be exposed to the internet, right? We talked about BMCs that don't necessarily have to be exposed to the internet. They have to be on a network that you could access and you could tighten down network controls. But one of the ways you might do that is through a VPN appliance. And the VPN appliances, um, <clears throat> Pulse Secure as an example, right, was very much targeted by threat actors. Um, and many of these devices, such as firewalls, um, we looked at um, recently ICS infrastructure in Denmark wrote up a report where the threat actors had um, a remote code execution vulnerability that was unauthenticated that provided an attacker um, uh, root level privileges on the uh, Zycel firewalls uh, in Denmark, and that was highlighted in their report. So we're working on um, not just detecting vulnerabilities, I think that's important, right, in, in some of these systems, um, but giving you a deeper uh, level of visibility into them um, and doing some uh, like threat detection and integrity checking on these. Um, so this particular functionality, for example, is we'll look at the firewall rules. <clears throat> if we have access to this particular device, and this happens to be a FortiGate SSL um, appliance, we'll look at the firewall and um, match that to uh, threat IOCs and go, your firewall contains a rule it's allowing traffic um, or proxying traffic for a known malicious source. Um, so we're, we're helping you uncover if your uh, the appliance has been compromised in this particular functionality, uh, which is which is challenging. I think one of the reasons why I'm you know advocating for an expansion and more functionality uh, in this area is because largely the folks I talk to uh, 
um, they don't have enough visibility into these systems. Oftentimes, um, you know, people share with me how through acquisition, we acquired this company and they had this particular VPN appliance and we just hadn't built in this visibility into them because it came through acquisition. The logging is pretty terrible. The tools for monitoring um, or vulnerabilities and threats on these devices and doing incident response are really, really poor. Um, so I, I think this is a good area to uh, to consider um, expanding your visibility into. <laughs> okay, um, so in uh, in this particular, oh, so this is detecting integrity failures. So integrity is really interesting, right? So I talked a little bit about uh, vulnerabilities, um, and I, I will get to I will get to questions too uh, as well. But so I, I talked about kind of the vulnerability category in terms of you know, both a network appliance and, and also a traditional PC server or a laptop. And that's just one, one aspect. Um, I touched a little bit on threats, right? I talked about how we can monitor some firewall rules to detect uh, an active threat. Um, the third category for me, and I think one of our biggest uh, differentiators and certainly something that gets me uh, excited is uh, being able to check the integrity of a device and the, the firmware on that device. Um, and the way that uh, largely we do that at a kind of a higher level, right, is we maintain a database of known good firmware, right? And there's, you know, millions of, of samples uh, amongst all of the different components and all kinds of different firmware. Um, then we look at the firmware that's running on your device and your environment, and then we do a comparison. And we say, this is supposed to be this firmware, but the known good copy that we have of that firmware uh, doesn't match up. Right. So that may mean that your firmware has been tampered with. Right. Um, one of those easy checks is does this firmware contain a file that isn't included in the official firmware, which could mean an attacker has gone on and put a PHP web shell uh, on your firmware. Um, and that would come up as an integrity uh, failure <clears throat> uh, in this case. Um, and some of the other things that we do for uh, integrity is baselining as well. Right. I look at that as a form of integrity. And what we can do is, um, and I use this to monitor largely systems that um, I know, for example, their UEFI uh, firmware that's on it hasn't gotten an update. Um, so I'm going to baseline that system. The OEM has not provided an update um, for that particular um, hardware running that particular firmware, no update from the OEM. So in our software, you can baseline that. Um, and it'll take a snapshot of the, the UEFI firmware and then it'll constantly make a comparison because it shouldn't change. Now there are some things that do, you know, are changed uh, as a normal business operations, and our software understands what should and shouldn't change. And if something does change that should not have, um, it will throw an integrity failure because it failed that baseline that baseline check. Uh, we can do that with bootloaders as well. So if your operating system hasn't been updated, but your bootloader's changed, it could mean something like Black Lotus or other kind of threat. Um, has uh, gained access to your to your system and changed your bootloader. And it's through that baselining integrity checking that we do that we can tell you about that. Um, and we do this for um, some network devices as well. Um, select network devices, we can do some of that um, detection that um, an integrity check uh, has failed for one reason or another. Um, so also, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting to look at uh, vulnerabilities in kind of a different light. And um, I like how we're able to filter on what's being exploited in the wild, right? I think many of us struggle with, uh, with priority, right? And so, yes, you could have a compliance standard that says you need to patch all your things, right? But not really talk about how you identify and prioritize that remediation. I, I think this has been a problem um since you know the beginning of vulnerability management uh programs the beginning of time is we've always been kind of overwhelmed and not really well equipped to be able to prioritize our remediation efforts especially today where there are so many vulnerabilities out there and we have gigantic infrastructure huge computing infrastructure you know how do we prioritize one way to prioritize them and i'm not saying this, this is the only way uh, right, because there's some nuances there. But 
Uh, one is if, if there's an exploit available. So if you're looking at the vulnerabilities in your environment, um, you know, is there an even an exploit? Or do we know about an exploit for that vulnerability is one level. Uh, and then, of course, we can say, is this if it does have an exploit, is it actively being exploited in the wild and prioritize those? And I, I, that's, you know, that's one way to do it. I don't think you can ignore all the other vulnerabilities in your environment. But certainly from a prioritization standpoint, we should be paying attention to what's being exploited in the wild is that probably presents um, the, the most risk in our environment um, if it's being actively uh, exploited. And you can see many of the vulnerabilities that are on this list come from these appliances that have been in the news that are being targeted by uh, malicious actors that are executing ransomware uh, campaigns. Um, and I believe this data, we rely on the CISA uh, KEV, the known exploited vulnerabilities list, um, to talk about if it's being exploited in the wild. Now, what I what I don't want people to get, and you know, I've been covering vulnerabilities on my podcast for for eighteen years, and um, some of the trends that I've seen is a vulnerability will come out. It may or may not have an exploit. Um, we may not even believe at that point in time that that type of vulnerability is even exploitable. It's not even known that it could be exploited. There have been you know bug classes that have represented vulnerabilities where. We just we never haven't seen someone be able to create an exploit for it, but a conference presentation or observed in the wild, someone figures out that, hey, I can exploit this vulnerability in this new way. And now you have to adjust your uh, priority for remediation of that vulnerability. So this is a continuous monitoring process, right? Um, but I also just don't want people to go, I'm only going to patch what, you know, what has exploits because... One, we don't know if there could be an exploit out there. We just don't know about it yet. Uh, and two, that can change at any time. And where I want organizations to be is go, oh, I patched that already. Like now there's an exploit available for it and threat actors are, are using it. And I don't have to sound the alarm. I don't have to rush out a fix. I, I've, already, I've already patched that, right? It's in my process and, and procedures and accordance with my controls that I patched that. Um, and I'm not saying you can patch everything, right? Um, but I think you just need to not only focus on if there's an exploit in the wild, um, don't get hung up on that. If, uh, recently I was covering a vulnerability, um, it was on some network compliance. I forget, uh, which one, and it was a denial of service vulnerability. And I was like, well, this, this could be exploited. And I'm like, well, if the, um, patch has a low operational impact and it's pretty easy to apply, like maybe we should prioritize it that way and just apply it so that if someone does figure out there's an exploit, we're all set. Um, we also support uh, device updates as well. And again, this depends on the device. Um, so uh, we can, in some cases, like point you to, here's where the firmware update will live uh, for this device. In some cases we can go, we've verified, we have this uh, update it's been verified and you can download it uh, right here. And in all other cases, we can provide you uh, with a facility within the product to actually push out uh, some of these updates to uh, certain systems in your environment. So um, we don't just help identify vulnerabilities, threats uh, and uh, integrity issues. We also help you with the remediation uh, of that as well. Um, so everything I, I've, I've shown you so far uh, and kind of uses some discussionary points uh, exists in our, the Eclipsium platform. Um, we also this year launched a new product called the Eclipsium Guide. Um, so in, in my mind, the platform is focused on what you have and um, monitoring what you have and doing continuous monitoring, looking for changes and giving you that the enterprise level um, controls visibility and management uh, for everything that you have in your environment. Where the guide comes into play is when you're going to acquire some new uh, product, some new software, or I mean, maybe you have some of that software and you wanna go into the guide and look at the supply chain risk model. It's essentially what the guide is doing is looking at the supply chain risks um, for all types, hardware, software, uh, firmware. Um, so we've created this uh, catalog, if you will, and based on a number of different factors, you know, public sources, uh, our own analysis of um, different uh, pieces of firmware, 
uh, for example, um, we come up with this like <clears throat> supply chain risk score. So before you bring this into your environment, you may say, I want this particular, you know, Dell PC, you can go to the Eclipsium guide um, and it can kind of tell you about the supply chain of that um, so that you can make better decisions. And I think the real value is like reduce your attack surface um, and reduce your risk before you buy it, right? So if you buy stuff that has a good supply chain, is relatively lower on the supply chain risk model, maybe it's history, you know, things like the history of vulnerabilities um, that have come with this particular device. How long is the device uh, supported? How many different components does it have? And what's the uh, vulnerabilities and threats that are associated with those components uh, all help, you know, accumulate and calculate uh, the overall supply chain risk for a device. And if you're choosing ones that have um, a better supply chain risk posture moving forward, uh, you'll have a lot less work to do uh, in securing your environment because you'll have a, a much less um, uh, uh, attack surface. So that's in a nutshell, the uh, Eclipsium guide. Um, you can see some, <clears throat> if you go to our website and you go to the guide, you can actually see like a little product tour uh, that we put together that's a video as well. I will uh, I'll field questions. There's a couple in uh, in there now. Uh, questions, what are the types of vulnerabilities that are detected and what's the source of information? Um, in terms of types of vulnerabilities, uh, there's a pretty wide wide range of vulnerabilities that um, are associated with uh, with firmware. So you know these could be UEFI uh, vulnerabilities. These could be um, vulnerabilities that are associated with network appliances. Um, and, you know, we source that from, you know, various uh, public sources of uh, CVE information, as an example. Um, and we'll also, you know, like independent of CVE, um, have our own vulnerability uh, kind of management uh, process as well. If it's a big vulnerability, right, we're going to put it in the product and do our best to be able to detect uh, that vulnerability, you know, based on the information that we have. Um, uh, available to us or through uh, some of the analysis that our platform does as well. Uh, and is the detection based on the product and version that the device reports? Uh, in some cases, yes. Yeah. So in some cases, <clears throat> the detection of a vulnerability um, it is based on, well, you know, it's this version in, of uh, firmware and that version has these known uh, vulnerabilities with it. Um, there is other functionality within our product that it's kind of doing, um, and we'll be talking more about this uh, in, in, the, in the coming months, but um, we do have processes within our system that do uncover vulnerabilities that like sometimes we, in fact, we've found vulnerabilities in firmware because of the analysis that our platform has done. And it previously was an unknown vulnerability. Uh, so we're doing some of that and we're handling uh, the disclosure. Um, so we do some, some interesting stuff, uh, you know, the things like decompilation, um, and uh, static analysis uh, of certain types of firmware in order to identify uh, vulnerabilities. So we kind of go the extra mile in, in, in certain circumstances. Uh, does the clip, did you do? Yeah, if your uh, needs to talk to a, a representative for uh, that is approved to operate on DOD networks, we have a Fed team uh, that you can speak to. Absolutely. Um, is it typically considered bad practice for a device to expose product and version number similar to uh, a web server? Yeah, it's a good question. Like, yeah, how do we determine what's running on that device? Um, so there's a couple of currently a couple of different ways that we do that. You know, one is uh, for systems that we support it, you would put an agent on that device uh, and that agent has the ability to look at all of the components and various firmware that's running on that device. And that's the best and most accurate method, right? And I've actually covered some ways in which you can use open source tooling to query your system to get that same level uh, of information, right? Um, and so you can look at those components using specialized tools and, and our agent uh, also does that, right? Um, for on the networking device side, sure, we can you know scan the network like you uh, mentioned and and remotely get the device and that's you know that's somewhat accurate and, and it depends um 
The other way is we can actually authenticate to uh, a network appliance. Uh, and with that authenticated access, pull back information about the system. Um, you know, coming from a, a vulnerability management background, um, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, either having an agent for that system or using some kind of authentication uh, because scanning over the network can be problematic. Uh, it can be difficult to ascertain if what a particular piece of software is just by querying it over the network, if it's even exposed to the network, uh, which is why I'm more of a fan of actually logging into the device uh, and querying it for, for what's on there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm happy to, to talk offline. Uh, let's see, what do we have on, on the next slide? Um, <clears throat> so yes, you can uh, book a live uh, demo. Um, we also have a newsletter that you can subscribe to, and uh, we I host the, along with Scott Shefferman, Eclipsium's Below the Surface podcast, uh, where we talk about firmware and supply chain security, uh, and we have all sorts of different guests from various backgrounds, uh, from technical to CISOs, uh, and we have great discussions uh, on that podcast, which is produced every other week, um, so make sure you check that out as well. Melissa, anything to, to add or... If I didn't answer someone's question, uh, there was one question there that I wasn't sure about, and I'll make sure we get an answer to you uh, on that. Yes, I was going to say the same thing, Paul. So yeah. if we didn't answer your question live, we will be following up after the after the <laughs> ends. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And Paul, again, another great session. And again, if anyone has any questions, please let me know. But we will be sending a follow-up with the links to the recording in the slides tomorrow. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone.